I love it when Mr. Burns shows a movie at work. I'm not sitting up front with you guys. It's bad for your eyes. <laughs> Suckers. <clears throat> Before we begin the movie, please join me in a moment of silence for the workers who gave their lives in an heroic... Movie! 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 The American Worker. Proud. Tough. Hard-working. And tired. These jobs are killing us. Outsourcing. Take them away. Yay! It's a miracle. They moved our factory to a third world nation. Now I have more time to play the lottery. Ka-ching! Hey, America. Why not let some of the other countries carry their share of the load? You can with the best kind of sourcing. Outsourcing. <laughs> what a great film, and I think it makes a terrific point. Effective immediately, I am closing the plant and moving all operations to India. Does this mean we're losing our jobs? No, no. Your jobs are safe. They'll just be done by someone else in another country. Okay. Greetings and welcome back. Oh, Simpsons uh, action for you. And so guess what we're going to be talking about in this particular chapter, outsourcing, right? Last time we looked at uh, economic geography, uh, part one, I call it, uh, we were looking at primary uh, activities and agriculture. And uh, today we're going to take a look at, uh, as I said last time, the, the more of the white collar uh, sectors, the tertiary services uh, on up uh, through um, your uh, scenery sectors, technical terms, I'll explain those, obviously. So, um, turn to uh, the um, lecture model, get that uh, up and going here. Like I said, uh, too, um, this used to be, when I first started teaching, this used to be uh, all one chapter, these uh, um, two sections here of economic geography of since been appropriately um, split up, easier to uh, explain and manage. In this chapter here, what I want to do is I want to I want us to break down the logic and early uh, economic theory. And last time we were looking at John von Thunen, and you guys were exploring around with my um, testing von Thunen kit. And uh, we're going to take a look at another model uh, this time. Um, basically uh, about where where to set up plants, you know, your factories. What was the most optimum place to do that? Interesting, um, uh, interesting concept. We want to explain economic decisions made by, uh, they, made by corporations and businesses. I could have probably included that in there as well. And that, you know, gets into outsourcing. And I want to do just that. I want to distinguish the white collar sectors. So a major heads up terms here for uh, this particular chapter, the least cost theory. Back in the uh, late 20s, uh, a gentleman by the name of Alfred Weber uh, posited the theory that there was an optimum place to set up a factory. So set up a factory and uh, you know, based on how you did that, you could be operating at a loss or a profit, right? So uh, we'll, we'll examine that. The substitutionary theory uh, kind of replaced, uh, well, it challenged Weber's theory, saying that it, Weber basically thought a lot, of, a lot of this came down to transportation costs, and probably a lot of it did in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, as time went on and technology improved, there were folks that said, hey, you know, you don't necessarily have to do A, B, and C here that uh, uh, of Weber's prescriptions. There are other things that you can do to save on cost, but that's the substitutionary theory. Now, the agglomeration, agglomeration is where the folks are, the market, right? We've seen a lot of $64 words, as I like to call it, geographic terms. This is another one of those, agglomeration, and basically just you know, talking, talking about the market. Uh, comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is basically the idea that don't spread yourself too thin with your resources. Concentrate on your strengths. Outsourcing. 
right? Outsourcing. Uh, we know generally what that is. You take your, you know, your companies and you move them offshore someplace. And we're going to take a look today at uh, some of the reasons. So this this week we'll examine some of the reasons folks folks do this. And then you have your sectors, your tertiary sector, your service sector, from you know your lower end uh, service good people provide goods and services. You don't necessarily need technical training to do it. You got to be sharp uh, uh, in order to conduct the businesses. I'm not saying that, but you don't need to go off and get four, six, eight years of technical training to do a lot of that. That end of the tertiary sector, uh, the quaternary sector, and quinary, you need technical training. Uh, tertiary sector, you know, when we're talking about goods and services, you're kind of tied to the markets. You you you're tied, you have to be. Uh, I mean, you can't be. You know, out in the hinterland someplace and looking to provide goods and services. You know, in a lot of cases, maybe today with um, you know uh, online buying and stuff that might that may have changed some. But your quaternary and quinary sectors, you know, you're starting to talk about you know conducting business and re uh, your, you know your your em your business emanates in research parks and universities. You don't necessarily have to be. Uh, where the consumers, you know, are walking to and fro out in Main Street in front of your, uh, in front of your business, being lured in by ad advertisements and and so forth. So, let's take a look at this, and we'll get into Alfred Weber. I want to get into Alfred Weber here, and let me set uh, this up by saying that and kind of just. Taking a look in the rearview mirror briefly at where we were at last time, trade in those primary sectors, those uh, the primary products that we looked at last time, constitutes about uh, one quarter of the world's rapidly expanding international trade flows. So that proportion, however, is uh, much reduced from earlier levels as manufactured goods grow as a share of developing country uh, exports. You have your raw material exports. They've suffered from price depression and commodity substitution and resource dependent developing countries have also strongly protested a harmful uh, perceived trade inequities. And we've heard a lot about that. Your secondary, your manufacturing sector and later stages of economic activity are responsive to cultural and economic rather than environmental controls at you know on their location. Least cost or Weberian analysis explains optimum plant location in commercial economies in terms of minimization of transportation, labor, and agglomeration costs. Profit maximization theory that recognizes through substitution principle that not one, but several points may be optimal enterprise locations. And uh, I'm thinking I can get this juncture here. It's probably wise to turn to page 278, figure 10.3, and um, we'll get to figure 10.4 and 10.6. So. Pages 278 through 280, we're going to camp out at uh, for a couple of minutes. And that leads us to our first set of um, first set of fills. Alfred Weber. Alfred Weber, the German economist, analyzed that plant location was determined by transportation costs. That is, where is transportation of raw materials to the factory the most cost effective? Or where is the agglomeration, the market, where activities cluster, as do people for common advantage? This is known as the least cost theory, sometimes referred to as Weberian analysis. Take a look uh, at the at the 
illustration, and ordinarily, I uh, just leave that to you folks to look at the illustration yourself, but it probably uh, would bear me elaborating on this, I think, a little bit. This is a, actually a tough visual uh, to understand at first by just first second glance. Figure 10-3, and I, like I said, I think this will be very helpful to you. And uh, I'm going to read the caption and then explain the illustration. This is the claim table solution to a plant location problem. Again, this is developed, you know, from Weber uh, in the late 20s, right? So this mechanical model suggested by Weber uses weights to demonstrate the least cost, tra uh, cost point, transport cost point, where there are several sources of raw materials. And you can see the raw materials on this table. You, uh, according to this model, looks like you have raw materials up in central Minnesota for this basic factory uh, that uh, is going to be set up here. Um, raw materials that the factory can use in East Texas and down in southern Florida. Late 20s, early 30s, by far and away, you know, your biggest market would be New York City. You probably could have probably added Chicago in there, I suppose, but you see New York City is where the market is. So uh, what do you do about your plant location? I mean, do you, you know, do you park it up in New York City? Then you got some transportation issues, right? Uh, before modern transportation, uh, you have some transportation issues with getting to Texas and Southern Florida and Minnesota. So kind of looking back at the, uh, the caption here, when a weight is allowed to represent the pool of raw material and market locations, you have an equilibrium point that is found on the plane table. And that point is the location at which all forces balance one another and represent the least cost plant location. And uh, I can make a really good educated guess at looking at where that optimum plant location is here. And it looks like it's about Greenville, South Carolina. That is located, I, mean, I see that dot in the northwestern uh, corner of South Carolina. And I know, uh, you, know the, you know, maybe the most optimum area there in regard to, um, you know, uh, recruiting workers, you know, some kind of a, 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 a employment agglomeration would be Greenville, South Carolina. Not that it, that matters a whole lot. And then you can see um, figure 10-4, right? When, uh, when an industrial figure A, when an industrial process requires several, several heavy or bulky raw materials, uh, an intermediate production site is often the least cost location. And then you can look at the other uh, illustrations there. Uh, figure 10-5, I'm looking ahead, thinking ahead here. Uh, one of your discussion questions in fact, your discussion question will deal with this concept, right? And uh, figure 10-5, you're going to want to uh, read that, get familiar with that. Uh, there's a section on your discussion question that will uh, delve into um, uh, that particular thread of uh, this concept. And then uh, figure 10-6, figure 10-6, page 1080, the spatial margin of profitability. Uh, again, this is an interesting one, too, um, and so uh, read that, and basically what, you know, the spatial margin of profitability is saying that, you know, during the, uh, the era where Weberian analysis uh, in, in relation to a lack of modern technology uh, would have made a lot of sense with transportation costs, you could lose money if you just develop your plant, plant your factory, um, just maybe 10 miles away, 20 miles away, you could be at a, a, a operating at a loss because transportation, the idea of transportation costs were, you know, uh, so exact. So look at that as well uh, this week. Just kind of finishing up here with Weber. Some theories counter 
some theories counter that uh, there are a number of variables, number of variables that will not necessarily follow the um, same scenario. And basically, they just felt that uh, Weber's analysis was too cut and dry. So the substitutionary theory, in their substitutionary theory, for example, they would say that one could replace labor with, uh, with capital. And uh, in, in economic terms, capital here is talking about technology, machines, okay? Some, it's used interchangeably sometimes with, with cash, right, investment. Here we're talking about technology. Or they can, manu you know, they can maximize their manufacturing locations, perhaps lower rent, right, which would then increase transportation. And you know where we're going here with this, right? We're going, we're starting to veer the plane toward taking your plant and going someplace else, right? Maybe out of the country. So let's start to move into outsourcing. And uh, let me set this up. Outsourcing and uh, just-in-time production processes. This replaced what they used to call Fordism, right? Think back to Henry Ford's Model T's, right? The assembly line production. So, uh, which have altered your classic locational assumptions. So the, the principle, which I'm gonna introduce you to here, of comparative advantage, comparative advantage tells us that areas tend to specialize in the production of items for which they have the greatest relative advantage or least relative advantage. Transnational corporations with multiple branch operations in countries other than their headquarters nation, they are active uh, practitioners of, of that principle and international trade as well. So a rapidly growing segment of the world's uh, integrated economy is um, a clear expression, if you will, of such uh, aerial specialization in manufacturing and commodity production. So comparative advantage in outsourcing. Comparative advantage, this is how areas can maximize the production of materials in which they have a comparative advantage over other areas. The key, the key with this is to specialize and therefore maximize the product over spreading oneself thinner by producing two or more products. That would especially apply to smaller, smaller states, right? With not as many resources to pull from. Outsourcing. Outsourcing, outsourcing when the comparative advantage amounts to lower costs in the factors of production. The factors of production are land, labor, capital, and even sometimes raw materials. In that event, in that event, they may relocate from a more expensive domestic site to a cheaper foreign factory for domestic sale. And that will tend to erode Weber's theory. Now, just backing up a little bit, those factors of production, these are economic, e economic terms again, right? Again, we have geography, the discipline of geography, overlapping and overseeing, again, one of your social science disciplines. It's not to brag, I just wanted to point that out again. Land, you know, factors of production. When Once land rent gets too expensive, when we, you know, a, a company could, could move on. Labor, you know, labor uh, regulations. It happens all the time. Here in the United States, um, the north, northern half of the country, northeastern half of the country is, um, you know, pretty much dotted, their factory is dotted with you know, labor unions. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but with that, you have labor regulations. So you have companies, you know, they're losing profit and they move south, southern part of the United States. Southern uh, part of the United States has uh, a lot of what they call free labor laws that you don't do not have to 
join a labor union if one is uh, developed in the particular company. And then sometimes the you know the uh, the companies move out of the the country altogether. So I mean they're not being unpatriotic, and uh, there are reasons why uh, they are doing what they're doing. They're you know business oriented, and you got to be careful of that if you overregulate a business out of business. That's uh, job losses, right? I mean that is a you know the, these places are not in it for a social uh, for, you know, social programs, but they do become uh, nice things, right, when you're creating jobs. So you got to be careful. You got to be careful of that. So, and here's the thing, too. Um, once a country does, or a country, once a company does relocate, um, something else to think about, too, they tend to help developing countries by providing jobs. They provide jobs and help the developing countries by lowering labor costs. Uh, foreign nations from Japan, uh, China, got some fills there, so China and Europe, they also take advantage of US policies. And as I say here, they set up shop here in the United States and they therefore provide jobs to, uh, to Americans. Figure 10, 8, page 284. Uh, you can um, check that out. I'm going to start looking now at um, moving to our last segment and the white collar um, uh, layers, the layers of white collar employment, the advanced forms of the service uh, service sector and um, get that set up for us here by saying that uh, your major manufacturing regions of the world include you know Eastern Anglo America, uh, Western and Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Eastern Asia, uh, the countries within the first three regions that I mentioned are increasingly becoming post-industrial, okay, as manufacturing is losing its importance in their national, those national uh, economics. East Asia, in contrast, uh, is uh, part of a newer stage of world industrialization that involves not only uh, newly industrializing countries elsewhere in Asia, but uh, also their counterparts in other regions of the developing world. So these high tech manufacturing activities, uh, as a result, becoming major factors in employment and output in all economies have, uh, have patterns of locational orientation and uh, you know, ad advantage uh, different from more traditional industrial enterprises. Your lower level tertiary activities, which I'm gonna, we're going to uh, examine here, they provide place utility, place utility for goods and services, and they are market oriented. They have to be near where the people are, okay? The quaternary sector is an advanced form of tertiary activity. It's not spatially tied to resources, environmental factors, or to market. Both the quaternary and the keenery activities may many dependent on uh, electronic communication and uh, data transfer are now major components of all advanced economies and of growing importance, by the way, in international trade flows and economic interdependence. Take a look at these notes, advanced forms of the service industry. Your lower level tertiary uh, services are considered consumer services, right? where demand and purchasing power are concentrated. So 
for success, one's base is contingent on being near a market. So to offer these services, technical training is uh, not necessarily a must. For example, hairstylists, uh, the tourist industry, gambling in the industries, and I think your authors uh, have some photographs of some of those industries. Figure, see figure 1018 and page 292 for your visual folks, and figure 1020 on page 295, which I think is a, I think it's just pictures of maybe cruise ships and tourist industries, maybe not as important as some of the um, graphics that we've looked at. Your quaternary skills, these are sk uh, technical skills that require knowledge. For example, tasks in office buildings, university classrooms, uh, doctor's offices, etc. And here's the thing, and you know this, this isn't a surprise, this trend will soon replace all of the primary employment as well as the secondary employment, right? We looked at these manufacturing employment that provides form, right? These factories making, providing form out of lumber, right? So, and then you can see um, pages 296, 297, figures 1022 um, through 1024. In fact, I think I will elaborate on that just momentarily as well. Um, instead of just, um, I know you guys are pressed for time in a lot of classes, but I don't want you to, to just gloss over these visuals. Uh, 1024 um, shows you the hierarchy of international financial centers. 1023, the world's major stock market exchanges. And uh, 1020 or 1023 is the ma world's major stock market exchanges, and then 1024 is uh, your offshore offshore banking. Okay, so uh, do check those out when uh, you get a chance. Your um, keenery sector, the keenery sector, consists of your um, top uh, top echelon positions, right? I see being screamed at there by the system that I misspelled that. Such as government officials, uh, the consultant business, et cetera, et cetera. Now this type of employment usually finds its, its base uh, in, uh, in urban centers, probably not unlike, um, not unlike the quaternary sector, near research parks, uh, universities and medical centers. And they therefore bring the potential to greater numbers of folks leaving the rural areas for the suburbs or somewhere near these functional hubs, right? You remember going back to an earlier chapter, we have various regions, right? There's formal regions, functional regions. Functional regions are regions based off of the economic activities that are, that are offered, right? So we see that tie in there. And there you have it. Uh, your uh, traffic organizer is there. We talked about uh, Alfred Weber today. You can see that the visual on what we talked about, least cost theory and cost effective location of factories determined by transportation costs, contingent on transportation of raw materials and agglomeration. Talked about comparative advantage, outsourcing, and then uh, your economic sectors, right? You can see your uh, visuals that I uh, provided for you there. Let's take a look at what is up ahead. We don't want to go here. Yes. Up ahead, uh, in your chapter, you have a reading on page 283. It's called, Where Do Your Clothes Come From? And uh, that will tie in uh, to um, you know, Alfred Weber, uh, Weber's uh, theories, uh, as well as um, you know, outsourcing and uh, comparative advantage. So that will um, satisfy that um, 
concept because again you're going to revisit that with the discussions uh, later uh, well actually later this week which is going to be a short week more on that in a second your um, comprehension uh, exercise and you need those um, because we have quizzes right it helps a lot of students out I'm going to have you guys create true false questions accompany you're going to need to accompany that with an answer key okay what I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to uh, break you guys up into pairs to do that and have folks um, <laughs> take I wanted you to give that to someone to take the quiz and I, as I was thinking about the logistics to all that, I thought, you know, um, the idea was a nice one because we don't get to do as much group work uh, with this, um, you know, in this format as I'd like. So um, uh, when you do the evaluations at the end and they ask about the group work, do remember that uh, Professor Lampkin did his intention was to do that. Uh, maybe we'll get to get to that um, again before the semester is or the course is out. But create some true false questions, and I have these themes there based on what we talked about. Make them intelligent, right? Make them intelligent. Uh, I think I have some examples on the instruction sheet of what not to do, right? If you want to get credit for it, because we have a short week, right? We're done Thursday this week. Uh, I'm going to have you guys start on the discussion on Wednesday, and you'll need to have those in and be by Thursday night at 11.59 instead of Sunday, okay? There's no lab this week because it's a short week. I hate to do that, but that's the, the route we're going to go. Um, if you feel educationally cheated about that, do let me know, okay? And then uh, Monday, we return and I'll have a quiz waiting for you guys uh, on this particular chapter. And then we start chapter 11, urban geography. And I think by this point, if we're looking at a football analogy, we're starting to begin the fourth quarter right, of, the, uh, of the course. So there you have that. I think that might be it. Questions, comments, get a hold of me immediately. Uh, like I said before, I do have some face-to-face -face classes uh, here in the Cambria and Somerset County. And um, so I can't get the things depending on what time of day you guys get a hold of me, but I will see it uh, by the end of the day and get back to you. So um, until next time, you guys have a just a wonderful week and uh, have a, a, a nice um, Easter, right? Have a nice Easter. That's something we can say here at, uh, at Mount Aloysius. I like that. So have a nice Easter, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.